introduce our speaker, uh, David Breen. David is a faculty member at Drexel University um, in the Computer Science the College of Computing oh, and Informatics. Informatics. Oh, yeah. Uh, it says here <laughs> in the blurb. Uh, he's also been visiting here at Carnegie Mellon for uh, the last semester, and he'll be visiting uh, a few more times coming up in March, right? Yes. So that should be good. Uh, if you have interest in working, uh, talking with him, you should obviously get in touch uh, for those times. Uh, let's see. He's got a, a varied and very interesting research background spanning computer-aided design, biomedical image informatics, geometric modeling, and self-organizing systems. He's authored or co-authored over a hundred technical papers. Uh, and today, I, I also one of the pioneers in cloth animation and simulation-based cloth animation <laughs> and graphics, which is really cool. And uh, the reason that I've well, been here with him recently <laughs> uh, as well. So uh, today he's going to talk about level sets uh, and what he's done with them. Level sets are a great data structure that are perhaps overlooked by a lot of us. So. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Thanks for thanks for coming. Uh, yes, I'm again at, at Drexel, um, working with folks up at the Computer Graphics Lab, but also the Morphing Matter Lab in um, at the ACI in Institute. Okay. Well, I realized I already uh, that you know I wanted to sort of give uh, as sort of an overview or of of the work I've done actually for many years now with level set models, and I realized I had so much material that I'm like, okay, I, I've got to start getting rid of some things and and uh, focusing on others. So actually, I know in the blurb it mentioned something about volume data set segmentation, but I think I will skip over that because uh, I have some focusing more actually on the morphing and uh, and the surface editing at at the end. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of introduction. What are level sets? Some of the mathematics. Some of what you know. What's good about them? What's bad about them? Um, and then talk a little bit about the applications I've been I've been working on over over uh, a number of years now um, on level set models. Okay. So what is a level set model? Um, it's really about uh, a, you know, it's a numerical mathematical technique for tracking interfaces, for tracking moving surfaces, curves, uh, again defined as a um, an ISO surface of some dynamic implicit function, right? So there's some function phi. It's a scalar field. You give me an x y, x y z. I give you a number. I give you a scalar. So it's some kind of uh, dynamic function changing over time, and we're interested usually in just one ISO surface, one ISO contour of this scalar field. Um, so again, it's a more general deformable implicit model. There's that you know that some function phi. It's some, it's in space 2D, 3D. It changes over time. We're interested in a particular ISO surface. Um, you know, you give me like you know what are the points in space where this function is equal to zero. So that would give you some ISO contour. The thing is that the representation, the underlying representation of a, of a level set is actually a sampled representation, right? So the, the representation is sort of n plus one. It's, a, it's one dimension higher than the thing you're trying to represent. So you use images to represent curves and you use 3D volumes uh, to represent surfaces. And, um, and the way you change the level set, the actual thing, the surface that's embedded in that, in that sample, um, is you change the values of the samples, right? This is an implicit representation, not an explicit. So you're implicitly changing this curve or surface by changing the underlying, um, uh, the underlying uh, values. And the way you change those values is that there's actually a partial differential equation that you solve to evolve the values in your representation. So I say this is a level set model. This is, this is a representation of a level set. It's the level set of a curve. It's a level set of that curve, right? So, so, so we're saying that we have this scalar field, and we're going to say, you know, let's say the scalar field goes from 0 to 255, and we're going to say what pixels have the value 127? And so there they are, they're in red. So, so the way we've implicitly represented this curve is by having this scalar field, and we're going to find those points where the scalar field is a particular value. Um, and the way you change the curve is you, by changing the, oops, the under, oops, click the wrong thing, the underlying samples. Right, so the way I change the curve, there isn't an explicit representation of the curve, 
um, I change the, the, the image in order to change the curve. So again, it's an implicit representation. Um, so again, but this phi of x is not a specific equation or formula or function. It's a sampled representation. And so for 3D, that's usually a sine distance volume data set. So, so what are those scalar values that we're storing in 3D? They're, so we like to think that they're, they're a distance value to the, the surface or the curve that we want to represent. We'll talk about 3D. And again, what is this, what is this, uh, this partial differential equation? Well, the level set equation was defined by Stan Osher and Jamie Sethian in a landmark paper from 1988. Um, so there is a specific uh, level set PDE. Uh, the, you know, the, the change, um, so what this function does is it defines how the, how the values in the function phi change, you know, change over time, you know, based on um, you know, the geometry of the shape that you're representing and also this sort of these other external factors. So we'll get into that. And so again, there's this, it's implicit. So we have these samples, we have a function that we, a, a PDE that we're going to evolve over those samples and we're going to sort of connect this all together to, to do a lot of nice stuff with geometry. Um, so there's that speed function. So, well, the, the level set equation, um, on the right side there's this thing called F. And, and that's called, that's the speed function, which is where you sort of, where you work inside this equation in order to get stuff done in geometry, right? So, so this, the, the deformation of, of the ISO contour is controlled by the speed function F. And what F is, is it, it defines the speed of the surface in the direction of the surface normals. So that's one thing that Osher and Sethian showed, that you can think about movements of this ISO contour as always in the direction of the, of the Tang uh, the, the orthogonal to the surface and the normal. And so it tells you what is the speed of this function of this surface um, in the direction, in the normal direction at some point x. So if you give me a function that says this is a speed field, then you can, then that says how fast should that surface move through space um, based upon this function f. So it turns out that what I've been sort of doing for years is thinking about, well, for a particular application, you know, everything has to get shoved into this F function. So, so if, if I want to do morphing, if I want to do geometric modeling, if I want to do segmentation, how do I define the F function, the speed function, for a particular level set um, application? And you sort of get all the, you build it on top of all this wonderful machinery and all these pro nice properties. Um, that you get all these sort of other stuff for free if you can figure out how to map your dynamic modeling problem into a, a speed function. So we, as I said, we define a bunch of speed functions for, uh, for several computer graphics applications. So why do you want to use level sets? Um, and why would you not use, use level sets instead of meshes? Well, what's, when it has a really wonderful property that impl all implicit models have, is that it always produces a closed, non-self-intersecting surface. So that no matter what you do with a level set, by definition, since you're working, since you're working one dimension higher than the thing you're representing, you get these properties for free. So here's an example. Well, it's a little dark, uh, but so we're we're zooming in on some piece of geometry here. Like here's some edge of some three-dimensional shape, and we want to perform an offset operation. Well, fine. We're going to take the vertices of that mesh, and we're going to just offset them in the direction of the local surface normal. Uh, boy. Hopefully the folks in front can see, but it will hopefully get brighter. And what you actually create for those in the front row is what's really known. This thing is so common in geometric modeling, it has a name. It's called the swallowtail. That this problem of self, of, of offsetting surfaces, up oh, is there? We can turn off the lights. <laughs> Thanks. Or at least dim them. All right. Uh, there were. Um, it might be the dimmer setting or off. I'll turn it back on in a minute. <laughs> okay. So this, this thing is so common, it, it has a name. It's called the swallowtail. And so, so I do this offset operation on a mesh. I now have to deal with these horrible self self intersections. But if I do the same offsetting operation in level sets, and so now we're taking a slice for a 3D thing, and so that, 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 that surface now is offsetting, um, if we do the same thing, in, in a level set, we get an offset surface with no self-intersections. Again, because the, the properties and the definition says we ne will never get self-intersections if you're taking an ISO surface of a, of a scalar field. Um, so there's a, there's a nice property that, again, we don't have to think about this. Forget it. It's not a problem. And so this is great 
for manufacturing. It guarantees that no matter what you have, your level set is manufacturable. It can be 3D printed. You know, again, this was years ago, but I work with people whose whole PhD thesis was trying to figure out how to fill holes in 3D mesh models so they could be 3D printed. So these things are, are, can be, can be um, manufactured, they're closed, they're no intersection. So if you want to send them off to a 3D printer, don't have to think about it. There are no, there are no problems you have, to, you have to think about. Also, one of the things that are nice about these things is that they easily change genus, topological genus. So holes can, can open, they can close, separate components can come together. Again, if you did this with meshes, this is a nightmare. Of course it can be done with meshes. But you don't have to think about it. The machinery gives you all these properties for free. So I would say ideal for complex deformable models where you have unknown, complex, changing genus. Don't have to think about it. So here's an example of a, of a morph, right? So this is a genus one object um, of one component turning into four components. So it's a, it's a chain. Um, and again, this is just simply, you'll, I'll talk about the morphing stuff. We're like, turn this into that. And I don't care what the genus is or what the components are. Um, you just sort of, it just, it just come, comes for free. Um, so again, if you have stuff, and again, can you do this in meshes? Sure, but boy, if you look at the, lit the morphing literature for meshes um, and trying to deal with change of topology, it's, um, they're not very good examples. This, this is a segmentation example. I won't talk about the segmentation, but this is a, an, I, you know, if you think about thresholding some 3D data set, obviously kind of noisy, and now we're gonna do a, a smoothing. We're gonna just sort of smooth this very noisy, who the heck knows what's in, inside this thing. But we can do a level set evolution and know that it will sort of fit a smooth model to it and we don't have to think about how many pieces are there, what's the genus, we just get it. Um, so again, this concise interface, you know, okay. I mean, I'm used to thinking about speed fields. How do we, how to create a speed field to get a certain problem done? So no mesh connectivity, no quality. My gosh, you know, you're doing a deformation on a mesh and you have these long thin triangles and you have to remesh the thing. Um, again, self-intersection. Also, don't have to think about, you know, any of the, any of that stuff. Um, you know, and again, when you're doing big deformations, don't have to reparameterize, don't have to remesh. So a lot of, lot of advantages. Okay, this is not a silver bullet. They're good, you know, everything has pros and cons. Did I mention there's no parameterization? Well, that's for a lot of graphics applications, that's kind of a problem. Having a parameterization would be nice. But it really turns out that I think a lot of, there are plenty of mesh parameterization techniques for parameterizing polygon soups, you know, so I think some of those could be applied to, to um, um, level sets. So I've been giving this talk and working with these things for a while. It's been interesting as I had my list and how people have been attacking each part of the list, right? So originally people used to solve a level set on the full image, on the full, um, the full volume. Of course now we do what are narrow band methods. If you're only interested in interface, you only do calculations in a narrow band around the ISO surface that you care about. And a number of people have looked at that. High memory requirements. Even some people did narrow band computation, but they still stored the whole volume. Um, but there's bit, you know, which which then limits the the amount of detail you can have because it, there's the huge memory requirements. Well, of course, a lot of work from octrees to run length encoding um, to to um, 3D hash tables. So now not only do we com do computation in narrow band, we only store the voxels in the narrow band. And the latest work by Ken Museth. Um, on OpenVDB um, is really sort of outstanding work. I'm, I don't expect that there'll be too many more names along this, but the OpenVDB is really outstanding. Um, and then the whole issue of controlling genus, it sort of feels like if you want to control genus, then why are you using level sets? But other people, people have looked at that. So anyway, that's, that's sort of the general idea of, of level sets. Again, sampled, um, a sampled representation of some scalar field, um, doing, you know, um, solving the, the level set PDE um, around a narrow band. Um, but let's, let's jump into some, uh, some um, applications and, and morphing's a very nice one. Again, why would you want to do level set morphing versus mesh morphing? A lot of reasons. Um, again, morphing, our morphing objects can change genus and the number of components. You just give me object A, you want it to turn an object B, done, right? 
that is absolutely not true um, when it comes to, to mesh models in terms of dealing with change of genus, having to worry about having compatible underlying mesh topologies, forget it. Um, and again, this idea of, of no restrictions on the shape or mesh structure, there is no mesh, right? So a lot of mesh morphing techniques are like you have to map every vertice in A to some vertex in B, right? That can be done, you can do remeshing, blah, blah, blah. Just give me a model, we'll morph it for you. So again, but you know, you can't morph everything. I mean, as long as they are closed, um, implicit models are solid models, so it has to be closed. Um, and so, but if you can convert your object into a level set, we can morph it. Um, and it turns out, and we'll, I'll touch on this, why there's a guaranteed conversion, uh, convergence, right? So again, you give me object A and B, I can guarantee that I can make A turn into B. You may not like what it looks like, but we can get there. And as long as objects, so it turns out as long as objects spatially overlap. So what is the, um, so what is, we have to start thinking about, okay, we have this idea, how do we map this into a, a level set equation? And the idea, and I'll have to admit, came from my, my collaborator, Ross Whitaker, um, who's, who's the one who introduced me to, to uh, level sets. Um, and so here's this idea. You want A to turn into B. So now what you should do is you should have every point on the surface of A move in its local direction with a speed proportional to the sign distance to B. Okay, you're going to move in the, you're going to move in the normal direction with a velocity, with a speed, um, proportional to the to the sign distance. So, so if you're farther away, well, let me just say this also depends about how you define sign, right? So, um, I, uh, at the, yeah, A is turning into B, right? So in this case, you know, it would be positive inside and negative outside. So you have to have a sign convention. Um, and so, okay, so there's a, there's a level set equation for that, right? And it really turns out that the F function, right, so the speed field that your level set's going to evolve in is simply the sign distance to the thing you want to become. And this is kind of a sketchy way of saying it, right? So, you know, I'm here and I'm going to move faster toward B and I'm out here and I'm going to move, fast, um, move faster toward B. Again, so this is... Each point on the surface moves in a direction. So what, what this implies is, is that if you have, again, depending upon your sign convention, I mean, or you can, it depends upon your sign convention of your distance field, or you throw a minus sign in there. But basically, regions that are inside the object you want to become, like the, the source um, is inside the target, it expands. But if the source is outside the target, it contracts. And so, and so this process will go until the source becomes the target. So in a sense, there's a guaranteed convergence if there is overlap, right? Because if your source is outside your target, it's just going to shrink into nothing. Um, but again, I, I talked about this. We think about it as points moving on the surface, but we're not moving points. We are evolving this PDE on a scalar field de uh, defined on some, some kind of regular sampling. Um, so here's some, some examples. Um, so again, the original work, we, we had minimal controls, and the way we would control how the morph goes is simply by how the two objects overlap, right? So in this initial one here, uh, we have this dart to this jet, and this was, we just redid, um, again, there was before us, there was a, a pretty, set, there was the first sort of uh, 3D morphing, volumetric morphing paper, and so we just recreated some of the results. And so with this configuration, what we see is we've got the dart turning into the, the jet here, um, and so the back fins on the dart kind of shrink, and then the wings of the jet pop out, and of course there's some changes that happen in the front. And if we change the configuration here, now, in this case, when we have this configuration, actually the back fins of the dart grow into and become the wings of the plane. So we had some minimal, minimal control. But let's just see what the, uh, uh, again, I, not, these are not always, oh, did it take two clicks? So anyway, here's a, uh, I'd probably speed this up. And again, the, the, so in this morph, again, we just, said we put the two objects together and you literally just hit go, right? And this is, this is what you get. You get you know, that dart turning into the jet. And it's like, okay, so you know, in that case, again, the, the, fins, the, fins, the fins went in and the, uh, and the wings came out. But if we use a different configuration, now in this case, we can see that the back fins actually grow into the wings. So it's a slightly different morph and, and, the, and the controls are just 
how do, how do you, and again, take some time to think about it, you know, how, how does, you know, how do you want to do that overlap? And again, this is getting back to this idea, if you can turn it into a level set, you can morph it. And so, you know, here's a model of some polygonal head, and here's a CSG model uh, made up of super quadrics, um, and here's an MRI scan, which we then ran through our level set segmentation. And, um, and so, in this case, I, I, I actually morphed between all these, I'm just going to show you um, one of these. Um, but again, so the idea is that we have this suite of scan conversion techniques, right? So you give me, you know, so we, we did everything from, um, you know, surfaces enclosed with Bezier patches to, um, you know, certainly polygonal models are common to CSG models with superquadrics. We can convert them into level sets. Um, and now you can, you can morph them. And so this is, this is a, uh, um, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the model extracted from an MRI scan, Dave Weinstein was a, a PhD student at, at Utah then, um, but this is a segmentation of Dave Weinstein's head and we're going to morph that into, um, again just by doing this place, we're going to morph that into the, into the model that was defined by that, by that polygonal head. Um, and again, it's, you know, so we do, you do some alignment, we kind of align the nose and the chin and we just hit go and it, and it goes. Um, again, I call this my one minute of fame. This is, there's actually a story here, which we can, if you care, I can tell later, which was sort of interesting how we discovered that this is the first time we heard, that we learned that level sets, are, uh, Ross and I, Ross Whitaker and I, that our technique was used in a movie. We thought, great, wow, all that hard work, and we made it to Scooby-Doo too. It was really worth it. Uh, but it's still out there, and, and, and um, Ken Museth has implemented level set morphing in OpenVDB. I was told it was used in the last Terminator movie. Uh, still waiting for the royalty check, but you know that's how it goes. Um, so anyway, so it, it's, it, is, it is out there. Okay, so let's just, but you know, this, the way we did this was really pretty limited, right? So the only controls in the original method, the method that's now in OpenVDB, is that you're going to have to overlap these things. So, so let's say you have this morph, and you got a horse, and look, you know, a morph and a camel, they look kind of similar, but you can kind of see the horse is looking off to the left, and the legs, and so the thing is, if you do this, if you do this, method where you just use the overlap. Um, yep, let's see. Oh, there we go. Um, you know, you get something that's really not so good. So, you know, maybe you can get an idea why. So when Ken Museth, who, who I work with, who was at DreamWorks, he's now at Weta, he'd go to DreamWorks and say, we should use level sets in our next movie. Um, and you know, and then they look at something like this, and they're like, "I, I don't think so." So um, you know, not yes, I can guarantee that the horse becomes a camel, but that's not a particularly appealing um, morph. Um, so we realized we had to we had to add some new features, and and you know, this has been done before with other other techniques, and so there's this idea of user control of that the user identifies regions on the source and the target, and so you're like, yes, I want the nose of the horse to become the nose of the camel. I want the foot of the horse to become the foot of the camel. Um, and so you define these features. And so now if you say, you know, with and this is not a whole lot. I mean, it's you know, We'll get into that, but it's not so many. And so you define a few features, um, and, you, and you really do get a, 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 better, a better result. So this is now um, sort of the, the current version of this, which is, okay, that's, I mean, now granted, it's a, not a, a little bit of a straw man in terms of, I don't know, I mean, we could have made the other one even worse, but, but still, that, that's, um, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great, great improvement. Um, to now include these user features and incorporate them. And it turns out, so again, I have to admit, my student, you know, of course students do all the, all the work, most of the work. Um, you know, my student showed me that and I'm like, that's, that's great, my gosh, that's a great result. And, and at some point, I don't even know when, if it's a month later, he makes some comment to me like, oh yeah, by the way, you know, I noticed that, um, you know, that, that this model changes genus. So if you look at this view, and you're like, oh my God, like why didn't you mention that? Or maybe he didn't know, but that's the whole point, right? That yes, you can do this with a morph. But the thing is, this thing, this thing, oops, ah, sorry. <laughs> I hit the wrong button, and I blew my, uh, my, uh, 
Oh no, sorry, I, I blew my big line, oh no. Um, I have to bring it up again, I'll make sure I hit the right button. Let's see. Um, you know, and I'm like, oh my gosh, but that's the whole point, is that we didn't even have to think about it. We weren't even aware of it. We just said, turn this into that, and I hope this shows that, there we go. You know, and that model changed genus. It went from genus zero to genus one. I didn't know about it, maybe he didn't even know about it, but we, we got it for free. That's the point of this. It's like, we, we didn't have to think about it. My gosh, we got it for free. To do that with a mesh-based method, can be done. I think it would be, you know, uh, uh, lots of lots of lots of user input. Would be, I think, it would be a headache, from what I can tell. So what did we do? So how, you know, the question is, given how do how do you incorporate these feature correspondences inside the um, inside a, inside a level set, uh, the level set morphing? And so what has been done? So what do you do? So what do you do with these correspondences? It turns out the correspondences now define a warping, a warping transformation that takes the um, the source shape and warps it to be approximately or closer to the target shape. And so if you can use these warpings so that the actual source is in the general shape or the surface of the source can be warped to be close to the surface of the target, you can now incorporate that into, into the level set uh, pipeline and, um, and then get much better morphs. Um, and so in general, so you know, there's, yeah, there's a pipeline for that. And, and so there are really two steps here. There is the original level set morphing step, but we also had to add um, a space warping step, which again, you find in other, other morphing techniques. So again, and generally the, the, morph, the level set morphing step is really good at transferring those surface details because one of the complaints I didn't, of, you know, as I showed you of, of well, even, even in the bad example I gave you, very often the intermediates of these volumetric of morphings are just blobs, right? They're, like the details just get kind of blended and interpolated away. But we found that we can get the morphing step can be good at transferring those surface details while the warp step is good at, at, at warping doing a macroscopic kind of warp between um, the source and the target. And so you start with these correspondences. Here's some other examples. You know, again, we want the nose of this guy to be, I don't know, somewhere on this, on this stormtrooper head. And we've got a couple things on the chin that are going to go to these two little knobbies on the stormtrooper. You know, we've got, and the ear was, was challenging, but still with four feature points, we kind of mapped it into this little earpiece thing of the stormtrooper. And similarly, um, this was also a challenging morph. Um, uh, because the heads of the bunny and the and the kitten were not were were not pointing in the same direction. But similarly, you know, the nose to the nose, we did cheek to cheek, we did lower ear to lower ear, there's the top of the head, we've got feet. Um, and so again, this provides a target and you know, so they provide the target and source model, and then you define these these features. Um, and so those features again define some kind of warping. And so what we found was we're going to use we use that we call the full warp to say when I'm on the nose of the source um, through the warping take me to the nose of the target and look up information that I need there to to, to morph my nose. And if I'm in the ear, okay, use the warping to go to the ear of the target and get and, and gather that information or use that local information so I can. Um, um, use that local information to morph between the ears. And so it turns out that if you do this morphing, this, this, this warp from the source to the target, you get this kind of distorted object. And so here, again, this sort of, remember what this looks like, like this, you know, this is what the stormtrooper looks like. We get something that's kind of distorted. So this is what actually is running in the level set morphing um, engine. We get this sort of distorted thing. So we sort of need to undo the, the warp uh, that we that we have in the in the level in the morphing stage, um, and so then we actually now apply sort of this incremental. It's like it actually probably an inverse. Well, no, it's not. And, you know, it, we do have to apply the 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 warping um, to the model that comes out of. So now we're actually extracting the level set, and we're finding that it's easier to warp a mesh than a level set because the whole idea of like 
applying a warping to a regular grid and having to resample, interpolate, we said forget it. We'll just apply that, that warping. So in this case, yeah, we felt like it, the, actually doing this warping transformation was easier on the mesh. And so, so this is actually just showing applying this incremental warp just to the source. And so, so as the morph is progressing, we're changing the shape and we're incrementally applying this warping step. Um, and so we extract the mesh and incrementally apply the warp. And so this is kind of what you get. I mean, if you can, um, this wasn't the ideal picture. I still got to work on this picture. But you know, so here's, the, here's that sort of warped morph. And then this is what the morph's going to look like once you apply this warping. You apply this warping to this guy, and you get this, uh, this uh, morph down here. Um, which, let's just do the, do the go, to, go to video. Um, and this, I think, goes a bit too. So, so there's that morph from this head to this stormtrooper model. Um, and I'm actually going to, I think, because it goes, it's a little bit by too quickly. We'll do it this way. You know, so you can, so you can see that there is, you know, like if you look at, I don't know, the nose and the eyes, you can definitely see this is the interpolation of the surface features. But then meanwhile, the, the morphing stage kind of finishes before the, the warp. And then, you, you know, the head's mostly done. And now you can see that warp is just getting, that into, getting it into the final, the final shape. Um, okay, but so we like, we wanted to really stress test this thing, right? So, so again, like, we don't care. Level, the, level set, the level set machinery takes care of genus and all that other stuff, right? So, so let's make a model where, like, it's just totally, we're going to subtract a bunch of noise out of that original head. Well, I used to call it the Swiss cheese head. Again, it goes by quickly, sorry. Um, you know, so we're going to take a head, we're going to take that head and we're going to subtract random spatial noise from it. Um, and now, again, we just give it to the level set and just say go, right? And so um, it does its thing. It basically just fills in, fills in the holes. I have no idea what the genus of this object is. And again, you can still see that the morphing is happening. The morphing, the morphing is filling the holes, getting the surface details, and then the warp is getting us into the final shape that we want. And then finally, I have to watch my time, okay. Um, we can also retime, right? So there are two stages. There's this morphing stage that has a DT, and we have a, a, a parameterized spatial warping, which is, which is a thumb function of u from zero to one. And so one of the things we allowed uh, the user to do is to say, make, make the DT that we use for the, evol the evolution of the, levels of the level set morph and the, the, the DU, in a sense, what is the function of what, what you know, give me a frame, and, a frame number and I'll, you know, and I'll give you a, a u between zero and one. Um, these are the default values. Um, and now we can now play with the timing. So, so the controls, the, the user controls, um, kind of say, define the spatial information. I want the nose, maybe I want the nose to turn into someone's ear, right? But, but how, how that happens over time and, and can be also controlled. So you can change the timing of these things. Um, again, this, let's see. How that, so this is sort of examples of, so this is a simple example in that because we wanted to focus on the timing, right? So we have this ellipsoid turning into some SUV. Um, and, and so what this shows is, is that um, we're separately doing the morphing and the warping. And so if we keep the timing of the morph um, the same, then at any particular frame, each model will have the same surface detail. But what we've changed is, is how quickly the warp gets applied. So these two models, I would contend, have basically the same surface detail, but on the one on the right, we've applied the warping at a faster pace. Um, so, so we get, so from the same features, we, we can now also control, the, um, control the, the timing of how quickly the warp gets applied versus how quickly the, uh, um, uh, the morphing step happens again, which, which transfers the surface details. Um, here's another one. Actually, I think t timing two is the same as timing one in the other one. But now here, oops, um, sorry. Uh, 
So here, we're applying the warping faster on the left, right? So it's warping, and actually we've slowed down the, the morphing, right? So, so in this case, again, we, can, we have controls over the timing. So in this case, right, we've, we've applied the uh, warping faster on the left and the right, but we're applying the morphing faster um, on the right. Again, so this is just going, showing some of the temporal controls we have over this. Mm, okay. So anyway, that, uh, that was uh, our, our, so the state of our, our morphing work. And you may not think of it, but that morphing actually leads to this problem um, and is related to this sort of next thing that we, that we did, well, in the middle of all this. Um, but anyway, those, the morphing is actually related to this problem. Because um, I also do biomedical work, and one of the things we, you know, we, we find in, in, bio, in biomedical work is we have these complicated 3D scans. Oh, this is on a timer? Oh, that's the first time I'm giving this, this talk this way. Uh, I blew my, again, my punchline. Uh, um, this idea that you have these 2D contours, and that you have these like 2D contours in space, and how do you fit a surface to them, right? So you might say, ah, yeah, given this set of, of parallel lines in space, these contours, what might, what could a surface be that would come out of that? Yeah, this thing's on a timer. That's what you get for reusing slides. Um, and so, um, so but where does this come from? This comes from very often in biomedical work. Anytime you're doing 3D scans, it's very often that it's, it's easier if you if you if you if you've got a 3D data set you can think about it as stacked images sometimes it's very difficult and again the lighting's not great these are dark images but these are very challenging images to segment um, and these actually have been segmented manually and so now we can segment these things manually but now we get the stack we get these stack of contours and again we want to be able to recreate the 3D the 3D shape that that was uh, that was imaged in this 3D the 3D process and so the idea that we had here is like, okay, you have this stack of contours, and we want to take those contours, and we want to sort of take this contour and sweep it into this one, and then sweep it into this one, and then sweep it into this one. Well, how might you do that? Well, you use level set morphing to do it. And so the idea was, is that instead of, we're going to now think about these contours as 2D, right? These are 2D, these are, these are, these are isocurves, um, and we're just going to think about Ah, we we want you know we want this curve to become this curve. Well, level set morphing can do that for us. We want this single curve to turn into these three separate curves. Level set morphing can do that for us, sure. So so we turn this this 3D reconstruction problem into and 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 cast it you know the solution as 2D level set morphing. And so the idea is this really the computation was done completely in 2D. So we had this, we had this deforming curve changing over time, and we said, well, let's just map time into z, right? So you're just basically thinking you've got this morphing curve, and it's changing over time, and we're just going to map time into z, and it sweeps out the surface. Now there are some tricky things because you want this to be continuous in 3D. So again, we're, since we're mapping time into z, we have to have these velocities continuous as they go across. So there was a little tricky stuff to constrain, to make sure that the velocity had velocity continuity across as you're going from one, one contour to the next. That was the trickiest thing. Um, and, and we use, you know, so the, the morphing uses, is an Eulerian approach, the actual morphing, but we use particles to sort of help with, with uh, with this velocity tracking. So anyway, here's the, uh, what, that, what that looks like. I hope it's bright enough. Um, and so there's just a sense of, yeah, now we're just literally, you're just watching that morphing curve, which is morphing in, again, in 2D in time, and we're just morphing that curve and just having it um, sweep, out, sweep out the surface. And again, we have this thing. We can handle change topology. Whoops. Ah, uh -huh. sorry, hitting the wrong button again. Um, we, have, we have change in topology, but anyway, I'll get to that again. Um, this one I may, in my, um, I'll zoom ahead here. So again, so this is that same thing. Again, we have, you know, we've got these single curves turning into multiple curves. Um, 
And so what, what this shows is, so this shows the actual computation, right? So we've taken this 3D reconstruction problem, and all we're going to do is we're going to, you're just watching the 2D morphs here. So one contour is morphing into the next one, which is morphing into the next one, and at every dt, we just map that to dz. And again, we're going to go through, and so Again, getting, getting that change of topology where one, one component breaks into two, again, you get it for free. I know I'm sounding boring. And then, so this is sort of the, the 3D shape that gets swept out when we do that. Um, um, oh, yeah. There are contours over there, but again, this is, uh, again, very low resolution mouse embryo. Uh, you probably can't tell, but also this certainly doesn't matter. And it also was true in the other example that the contours aren't evenly spaced. That doesn't really matter. Um, this is that, that pelvis example. And again, for maybe those in the front row, again, this, I mean, there are mesh-based methods. And they're, to me, they're a nightmare of just trying to figure out, like, all this work you have to do that you have a vertex on N, and you have to figure out what vertex it's connected to on N plus 1. And then there are all these stupid rules for when it branches. And oh my gosh, forget it. Um, I mean, it can be done, but, but this was pretty straightforward. And, and this is a fairly complex model in terms of, you know, changes of, of sort of genus down here and something's going on down here. And, um, so anyway, it was sort of morphing, morphing to the rescue. Yeah. This, this last part, okay, I know I, I want to leave some time for, for questions. Um, this one I'm going to zip through. I'm, yeah, I apologize. Again, I told you I already got rid of material. Um, so the question, even as I want to talk about this stuff, I, I ask myself, you know, do level sets have something to offer to geometric modeling? And I think in that, they're, they're a representation, again, that easily changes genus, is sort of guaranteed to be manufacturable, you know, that, that you can, as long as you sort of apply a proper level set evolution, the object will always be manufacturable. That seems like a pretty nice property. Um, but really more important, some of the motivation is for this is that level sets have been used. Um, you know, there are lots of uses for level sets. I don't know if you know this, the mummy movie, the terracotta warriors in some mummy movie, those were level sets. Uh, those are level set models in terms of being able to fracture that. The clouds in Puss in Boots um, are defined as level sets. This is a wonderful animation. So I think it's a Bacardi ad of this, this dancing water figure and water is just splashing off his dancer. This is Sandman from... So, so the thing is that, and again, this is, I work fairly closely with, with Ken Musseth at Dream, well, DreamWorks now at Weta. And you know, and this idea of like, wow, you know, we're like when you do when you do a dynamic simulation for one of these things, the director never likes it. The director hardly ever likes it, right? There's never a, a, a simulation process where you know, the director, whoever looks at it, like, great, first shot, wonderful. I mean, there's always tweaking, there's always like, yeah, this is great, but you know, there's some water kind of thing over here, can you please get rid of that or make it do something else? And so, the, really, the motivation was, level sets are used in the simulation and special effects pipeline. If you want to edit them, you need editing tools for them. And so that was really more a motivation of, of you don't want to have to, like, convert them to meshes, do the mesh thing, bring them back, convert, forget it. Um, anyway. Um, and here's this a very simple biomedical application where you know you get some 3D scan and you have a volume of it and you know and it's and you just do a simple thresholding and there are basically errors like you know the doctor knows that those two vessels are not connected that way or this vessel should be connected to that and so we just wanted tools that allow us to directly uh, work with um, um, uh, work directly with level set models and so here's some you know some. I'm, this is I'm definitely going to sort of show, show pictures and just give you the general idea. Um, again, the same thing. You know, we want to be able to use this level set editing framework. We have a bunch of conversion tools that can turn them into level sets. Um, well, you take them in, and then the conversion tools that voxelize them into level sets, and then we created this a number of operations. Again, every operation sort of is guaranteed to produce a proper level set, and so it just you know it, it just, you're able to then just obviously then just feed it back. Um, and then finally, level sets can be, you know, you can extract meshes, you can volume render them, um, you can also look at point rendering them. Um, and so we, we, you know, we tried to take a, a structured approach to figuring out what is that speed function. Again, all this is mapping, mapping what your requirements into some, into some speed field. 
Um, so we said, let's try to look at this in a structured sort of way. So, so this is a, the distance cut off. So like, I only want there to be a level set evolution in some portion of space. So the, only, the, the surface will only move in some portion of space. And that sort of defines a regionally constrained the feed function. Goes to zero outside some region. And then we might say, you know, but we want to do something with the curvature. So we only want the curvatures to be within some, some value. So again, if curvatures are below or we restart, you know, are below something, don't do anything, or above something, don't do anything. And then finally, you have functions of geometric measure, which are like curvature and surface normals. Um, you know, anything you can compute about your geometry, you know, map um, geometric properties of speeds. Um, so the thing is, level sets, I mean, doing volumetric CSG, we, did, we were not the first people to do that. But, but the thing that this really, uh, um, really was able to do fairly easily, and which I know, coming from the computer aided design community, is like, this is also on a timer, wow, um, is that blending, right? I mean, there's so much work on how do you, if you take two things together, how can you smoothly blend them? And so we've been able to show is that if you give me a level set, I don't care what the shape is, I don't know where it is, if it's a level set, we can blend them together. And so this is sort of a close up, I hope we can see better. So we're, we're, you know, there's sort of this, this reddish object and gray object, and we're positioning them, and we do with some kind of CSG union. And the point of the slide is that, that again, this is a sample representation, so it's kind of you know, noisy, and there's a very sharp, ugly edge here. Um, so what we can do is we can, again, two level sets. It's like, show me the places in space where the two level sets have are near zero. And that gives us a sampled line in space. Um, oh, you can't see there's a, that's, um, it's, yeah, sorry, anyway. And so we can say, there's, a, we, we know we can compute sample to the resolution, where are these things intersecting, we can compute a distance to that, to that, that line, and we can say, okay, now perform a smoothing operation within some distance of this line. Um, ah, I, I can see it, I know what it looks like. Um, and the idea is you can do a curvature-based smoothing between on, on, on an arbitrary intersection. So that's, that's a non-trivial um, re result in computer-aided design. Um, and of course, these things are distance fields. So doing things like morphological operators is, comes for free. Again, so this is like, here's some noisy scan. You do an inward offset um, to get rid of the spikes. And then you do an outward offset, right, which is the, the definition of morphological opening. And you get this sort of globally smoothed object, again, that sort of came for free. Um, and so here's just kind of a, a, an editing session um, where we wanted to you know, start with that dragon and make this double-headed wing dragon. Um, again, this is sort of CSG, volumetric CSG. You, know, you cut off the head, um, you double the head, and put it together. But again, the point is, is that you get this very nice, smooth blending between those two things. And now we're going to you know, union it onto that. But again, that's the union with the blending. So there's really wonderful sort of seamless uh, joint there where those two things came together um, and now we're going to copy the wing and again so actually the, the example from before was this was in this region right here where we could smoothly blend in that object um, again do it the other side Got, again but the whole point again it's like ah didn't want to go back yes it doesn't go backwards sorry um, and so but the point oh my gosh sorry all right I'm, I'm out, of, out of practice, I haven't given this talk in a while. All right, let's just, there, okay, sorry. There, okay, again, the, again like the thing of the change of genus, like okay, we, we scan converted the super ellipse, a super toroid, and again, just kind of doing a, 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 a volumetric CSG is really no big deal. Um, again, so we've changed the genus of the object with this, and it's no big deal. Um, and again, and then we can sort of do that smoothing around where it was put together. Um, and then again, that's the object that, that I actually have this in my office at Drexel, um, which then, you know, it's just straightforward to do the, do the scan conversion. I mean, to do the, the 3D printing. All right, gotta go. Um, we did another one. Again, fix, you know, got a nose, put the nose in here, copied something from here and blended it in there. Um, did this, trying to do this sort of sharpening thing. So I think I am, the, the rest of this is gonna really fly by, because I know you guys have been, Patient might as well have some time for, for questions. And this is just some of the other work. I mean, so this was clearly just 
volumetric CSG with the blending was, the, was really the most interesting thing going on here. And I've, I've had actually student do other things where we actually are looking at interactive, more freeform editing. And again, in the set, you know, for every one of these operators, there's an F function for that, right? So you know, all, these, all these sort of operations of being able to pull. So this is, again, very not for a particularly compelling example of, yes, we can pull a surface and we can you know, change the genus, right? We can make these, these, uh, these little loops and again, just don't have to think about it. Um, you know, and so anyway, putting, putting uh, drawing on surfaces and pulling on points, drawing on, you know, pulling up, pulling up uh, uh, curves on surfaces. Again, you know, maybe from the front row can actually see the pictures. Um, you know, there are all these sort of freeform operators being able to change some of the, the, the alpha value in the, in the speed function. Uh, these sort of detailing tools, you know, kind of like a little wand that you run over a surface and it, and it either goes in or goes out. And so if it goes in, it's sort of like this 3D eraser, right? So you add this tool and, and it makes, and it makes the, everything inside it shrink. And so you can use it like this, this, 3D, this 3D model eraser. Um, uh oh, there we go. Didn't. Uh, you know, there's also interactive smoothing. You can say inside this tool, do a curvature-based smoothing. So we had sort of this error, and this sort of problem model here, and, and again was able to interactively smooth it out. Um, again, sketch-based, just draw curves over level set surfaces and have the level sets grow into them. Um, again, kind of a funny, funny example there. Not just one curve; you could do multiple curves. Um, draw multiple curves over surfaces and have the level set sort of move to, to f approximately fit those curves. Um, different ways of, of controlling that. Um, th again, these are sort of global deformations. You know, you have a blob in space and you draw curves around it. And then the level sets sort of grow out to fit, to fit those curves. Again, there's, a, there's an F function for that. Um, um, one of the things we did, and we've actually been kind of, you know, this is now, I would say, obsolete given OpenVDB, um, is that we were using 3D spatial hash tables as a way to store our, to store our, our, our narrow band voxel values. So sparse, constant time access, um, you know, not limited by, you know, it's a hash table, just isn't really limited by any, any predefined domain. Um, we didn't really solve the problem, easily solve the problem of being able to get, sometimes you do need values outside the narrow band. And then some of those results of just sort of free form, you know, again, trying to stress the change in topology. Um, again, I had a little honey bear on my desk and, you know, sort of motivated my student to try and make, make a model of that, again, just by sort of carving these, these level set and pulling and carving these level sets. Um, again, taking that head model, you see that a lot, and then sort of adding other features to it. She even added some voxel coloring, more of these models. Okay, we've seen these before. Um, again, this is sort of, you know, this is a model that, that effectively, you know, is 3.3 billion voxels if you actually had to store the whole 3D array. Instead, you know, the narrow band only has 28 and a half million uh, voxels. Um, and that's the, the advantage of using these, these narrow band techniques. Um, and then we're just, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I've also worked, you know, worked around people doing multi-resolution modeling. So we decided we want to bring that to level sets. And so this idea that you actually have some high-res model, let's say 1K, 1K cubed, uh, you smooth it, you can sort of do some kind of difference, and we would extract the difference information in what we'll call these detail particles and show that, you know, if you take the smooth model and, and, and connect them with the detail particles, you can reconstruct that model. And you're like, well, why, you know, like, why do you need to do that? Um, um, the one, and so, that, again, it's a level set evolution that restores the details. Um, and again, because we wanted to do multi-resolution modeling, right? So this idea that you do an edit, you have, you have different resolutions of your model, you do an edit at a lower resolution, and that lower resolution, uh, that lower resolution edit propagates, I guess so this is the, the, the punchline, you, you, know, you would do an edit at a much lower resolution, it gets propagated through the, the multi-res hierarchy, and it ends up, it ends up at the high-res model, um, with all the appropriate high frequency details. Um, similarly, sim very similar idea. 
Uh, the last idea, and then, we'll, then we're definitely going to wrap up. But the thing is, we, we've now extracted what we call these surface details from the model itself. And so that brings us to the idea of doing geometric texture transferring. So can we use these tra transfer these detail particles from one model to another to transfer surface texture? And so here's an example where we use that tool, and we're going to erase that capital off the, off the lion. And so he's now got this bald spot. Uh, we're going to copy the detail particles off the back of his head, and now we can just apply those detail particles and apply the, the detail evolution process. And on that, as I see people heading out, uh, thank you very much. Again, just gave you an introduction to what level set models are, talked about some applications where they can be used. Of course, there are bunches of papers if anyone wants to, you know, sort of find out more about this. And, um, Thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. Any questions after my run through level sets? Yes? So I unfortunately have to run off to a meeting, but <laughs> I have one, uh, yeah, one little question here. Maybe it's not a little question, but. Uh, You've shown a lot of results with level sets. Yes. Uh, is anything still missing? Are level set tools solved? What's really, well, um, what's really missing, I showed you the modeling work. Um, um, speed is missing. So, so, so Ken Museth has something called OpenVDB, which is software based. My understanding is that NVIDIA is developing G. GVB or something like that, um, GDVB or something where they're actually uh, have starting to implement the OpenVDB data structures on GPUs. So, so you know, so even for interactive editing, I mean, doing this. So I would say, yeah, how do we get uh, level sets onto GPUs? You know, there's been some work on that, but the data structures are damn complicated, right? So, so. Um, you know, like how how do we how do yeah how do we figure out how to get level sets to really work and hum on on GPUs would be wonderful. You know, so the thing is, you can do a GPU like GPU like oh great, but the thing is, we want narrow band level sets, right? We don't want to have to store the whole 1K cube volume or whatever. So obviously, computationally. Um, you just need to do computation in a neighborhood. You just need neighborhood information. So it's a very local computation that seems to be really, you know, mapping well into the G GPU. I think, of, yeah, into sort of GPUs. But it's just more that these these narrow band data structures are very complex because you don't want to have to store the whole thing. And so that's, I'd say, that's really an open an open problem. You know, an open problem. You know, that would be great. I mean, that's what's limiting. I mean, and you saw, the, again, the, these modeling results are somewhat old, but still, they're kind of still low res and blobby implicit models, right? Um, you, know, these, this, you know, these guys, this is sort of new stuff. This is, this is, this is sort of getting, but even then, these, these resolutions are not like 2K cubed or 5K cubed or, you know, really high res. They're, they're still, I don't know, hundreds, hundreds by hundreds by hundreds kind of models. So anyway. Jeep getting these things to run on GPUs. And I don't know what NVIDIA is up to, actually. I just found out about their, their, their OpenVDB implementation, which is incomplete, according to Ken. Yes? Uh, for the mapping between key points, uh, between the mocks, yes. I mean, do, are people applying learning-based methods to find <laughs> those like, matches? That, that, that's a, yeah, that, that, not that I'm aware of. I mean, well. We haven't, but absolutely. I mean, so right now, you know, be able to give, I mean, so again, on one hand, I think the, the idea if you work in, in Hollywood is that they want control, but they want incremental control, right? So the idea would be, well, here's one head and here's another. Figure out what the correspondences are. Figure out what the features are. So that seems like a, you know, also open, be a great uh, way to provide additional, uh, you know, sort of automatic first step. You know, directors will always want to go in and tweak things by hand. But look, hey, we can make a little because, like, right now, like we we couldn't. Like, it would be great to say, here's the horse, here's the camel, go, show me what what you can come up automatically because you'd automatically find those correspondences. So that would be yeah, a great little feature to have. Uh, I saw that hand for us. Yeah. Um, 
So I'm finding it hard to understand the, the data structure you were talking about. So uh, the, um, the, the, the the representing the model, yep. do you still use like the meshes or point clouds? No. So level sets can represent the, the data structure itself, I mean the, the model itself, is that the can, idea? Can represent? So can, can a level, so for example, like the models that you have in the slide, right? Yeah. Right? So can a level set represent that model uh, in the sense that, uh, so what, what does it mean like storing that uh, in, in that computer? Right, so if you, if you have a mesh model that's uh -huh. closed, that has a well-defined inside-outside, you know, inside-outside, there are methods for, you know, converting a closed mesh into a signed distance field, which is what the level sets want. And then you can apply all the... Yeah, ones. right. So, yeah, I mean, everything, everything is just, again, that image. It's like, this is a level set curve. It's just an image. I mean, a narrow... I, actually, I should, there's another picture I should show. I just so, realized that, uh, yeah. Does, does that have, like, more... Uh, uh, I mean, that, that, for, from the memory perspective, is it like uh, taking more memory than a, than a mesh representation? Um, it probably still is, yes. Is that the I, th I think it, it, prob it probably still is because you actually have to store a narrow band, right? So you're not just, you have to store like, because of the numerical methods, you have to store three voxels on each side of that, which, sure. I mean, if you have a little triangle that has three vertices, ah, but now I've got to store... That's a little bit more. Now, if let's say for that, that, if that triangle is the size of a voxel, I've got to store that voxel, and I've got to store at least three voxels around it. So it's a, still a little bit more, yeah. So you showed oh, that's surface it. reconstruction using contours as yes. constraints. Is there any possible extension to point clouds that maybe you have an incomplete point cloud and you want to use them? Yes, it, there, there's been work on that. Yes, so level sets to fit to point clouds. Um, yeah, so Ross Whitaker's done that. At Utah, Ron Fedko, or, or Stan Osher's maybe even worked on that. So yes, fitting. So yeah, one of Ross Whitaker, again, I, I learned about level sets from Ross Whitaker, um, who's at Utah. Um, one of his earliest papers is fitting level sets to, to laser scan, noisy laser scan data, which is, I'm sure is probably point samples. So yeah, right, yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, I should say thank you for coming and talking about level sets. Uh, I think they're very great. Like they're, they're very useful blending collaborative and they're useful in a lot of ways. But the one problem they ignore for the reason they're so uh, beneficial uh -huh. is that they kind of don't have a good answer to like correspondence. And I, I'm more of a vision person. Yep. Vision, you, you really want dense correspondence between the shapes. And you perform this level set evolution, you don't get a good answer to correspondence. You either don't get one at all or you get a very bad one. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I mean, that's why you don't have texture maps on your yeah. uh, on many of your images, because if you had, yeah. that, that's the fundamental favor, right? If you had a good way to do correspondence with level sets, you could texture map one image, evolve it, and it would still give you a sense of answer. I, I hear Ken's working on that, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people have worked on it. Yeah. The particle level set work and the spring level set work, they all require all this resampling, yeah. and there's still not a good answer to correspondence. So while you can do this blending, mm -hmm. It almost seems like the reason of the blending is nice, it's straightforward, it's simple, it gives us nice properties, but like you gave this example of the horse blending into the camel. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And you're, you know, the nice thing is the level set smoothly gives you this gene transition yeah. for now a torus, right? But uh, or a mar. Um, but the problem with that is the horse is not like a horse, it's a horse, it has four legs. Like uh -huh. you would really want the method to highlight and say, you know what, something weird is happening here. Mm -hmm. And and mm. this doesn't do that, this kind of skips it over. And mm -hmm. Like there's all, all these other issues like, you know, as rigid as possible is like a very nice, like a lot of people like as rigid as possible, which is a method for like mesh deformation. Yep, yep. Because it preserves details. Whereas yeah. the more you deform these level sets, the worse they get, right? The more you, you what? The the face. Say it again, the more you the what? The more you deform these level sets, the worse your like shape gets. Like if you rotate the face around a thousand times, the nose is going to disappear. Unless oh, you're, you're saying in terms of, right, the dissipation from the, yeah. from the, from the, yeah, like sure. these, these evolutionary solvers end up, yeah. these things become more and more ball-like the more you use them, so you have to be careful. And mesh representations don't have these laws. So I guess the question is, <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, if you yeah, then, yeah, yeah that, 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 so, so you're right. So there's an example of, oh, now, now we have to do something on level sets we don't have to do on meshes, which is do, you know, post-process them to keep the damn details there. I mean, yeah. so actually that's part of the melting resolution work. Meshes, yeah. you know, meshes have these strengths, and yep. level sets have these strengths. Yep. And um, what we would really like is something that's simple, deformable, and actually keeps correspondence. 
Again, what do you mean by keep correspondence? So I'm just you, you, can, you, know, you morph the camel into a horse. Right. You can tell, I can pick a point on the camel and yeah. tell me exactly where it maps to the horse. Right, right, right. If you do that, oh. with, the, you do that with, the, with the speed field, you get basically new shapes show up out of nowhere, right? Because they kind of take the most direct path. Like the nose might pop out of nowhere. It won't matter. Yeah, yeah, right. And so now all of a sudden, you're right, you're doing, I mean, we kind of had to do that, not quite, but for the reconstruction, right, so now you're using, you you're, throwing, you're, you're, throwing, you're throwing particles in there, like to do that correspondence, like you now have to invect particles. I'm and just brainstorming. You look at the particle sampling on the horse, and you look at where those exact particles winded up on the camel, yeah. they, they're not uniform. Oh, yeah, no. But, but perceptually, a camel and a horse have a kind of Correspondence mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and, and level set illusion methods can't really give us those answers that I've seen. And so, okay. I guess, do you know who's working on like correspondence? I I do not. I mean, it's again, let me just understand like th like this idea that this would be like saying, okay, there is some local parameterization around the nose of the horse, which you know, which is which maintains distance, geodesic distance. Yeah. And now that when you do this morph, you want to know where that mapping ended up yeah. on the camel. Yeah, you kind of coherent, right? Like, yeah. It's nice if you morph my face and your face that, you know, our nose, like the, that we had a right. between the yeah. noses, and that, you know, my nose did just blend into your, like, upper lip or something. Right, right, right. Yeah, you're, uh, And that probably comes from the topological convenience of using a level set. Yeah, 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 no, it's... But we, we lose this correspondence for a vision person. It's like, we really want correspondence. Right. Um... Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I um, right, but then so it's. I mean, so I, I really rush through the rush through the, the the editing work. I mean, partly the way we did this multi-resolution is that we had level sets with particles, right? So, so that that yeah, we had level sets with particles, and I'm and so the thing is, and even in the reconstruction work, it uses particles, but it used the particles. It's kind of like we said, oh. You know, this, po this point on this, this contour is going to end up at this point on this contour. And we use that particle to make sure that the, you know, we use some, I forget now actually, but, like we, but so we would say, yes, we know this is going to turn into this with this velocity. Oh, how do we adjust the, the level set evolution so that the velocities are continuous? But, but I, I've used particle level set methods. Yeah. You actually look, I mean, they, they have to resample and spawn particles yeah, right. all the time. Right. And that kind of it gives away the exact thing I'm hoping to get. Yeah, but the thing is, if but the thing is, if if the horse and the camel have different surface areas, how can you? Yeah, yeah, but the horse and the camel. Will, uh, I think we can all come to that a horse and a camel should have some sort of dense, nice, uniform correspondence between them. Yeah. But right. the thing is, but, but the thing is, but the thing, I mean, you know, I, I use this example of you use this local mapping that is, you know, parameters by geodesic distance, but if they, but if they have somehow drastically different, like, I don't know, drastically different surface areas, then there has to be resampling. Sure, sure. And, and level sets are great for turning a blob into a face. Yeah. But when I have something that's already pretty close, I'd like to maintain some of this correspondence. Yeah, okay. Gotcha. I mean, yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, so certainly what, what, what we did is, I mean, so in a sense, that's what the spatial warping does. Yeah, but you have to do it explicitly, right? Like it's As in explicitly meaning you have to, yeah, I, I have to say this. Right, you can, you can establish these correspondences. Yeah. The great is that through the evolution process, it maintained correspondence. Yeah, but. But then you have to track genus, basically. Yeah, yeah, but the thing is, look, but but the thing is, like, how do you know? I mean, like, are you saying? I mean, I'm just trying to understand the, the problem domain. Like, okay, I have this head, and I know where the nose is, and the ears are, and the you know the chin, and I'm gonna I'm going to morph it into this other kind of head, this data, this point cloud. You're, let's you're say. A map from my face to his. What's that? You're a map from my face to his. Yeah. It'd be good if you could say, well, the eye, but use my face texture map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, like that. My eye would go to his eye and not onto his glasses. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so that, okay, that, if I think of it in those terms. Yeah, that's uh, what I mean. Level set methods can't seem to do this. By itself, no. No, but I, I you know. And the particle ones give you garbage answers. What's that? The particle level set methods give you garbage answers. Oh, yeah, I'd believe that too. But I mean, in terms of this, but the thing is, 
but but how does it know? Yeah, the question is again. You didn't like. I mean, or didn't you know? Sort of didn't like this idea of like. Yes, in this method, we've identified the nose in model A and the nose tip of the nose in model B. Do you want? Do you want it to somehow to? Again, I'm just trying to understand how much information you have about model B where you end up. I mean, so you know, you, you can clearly evolve between the two shapes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but 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 can it use the information that we've defined with the correspondences? Well, it's already it's already finding this map. It's already finding this deformable mapping. It would be nice to deformable mapping to maintain the correspondence. If you if you're doing with a different if you're a priori saying well these feature correspondences should exist and I want to maintain my flow field to these end up being true, that's one. That's uh -huh. what we would do. Uh -huh. It's not using a level set method to give you correspondence. Right. Right. It would be good if you could give you correspondence. Between it's using a level set deformation. But but meanwhile, that's got to be. But you've got to. But that's maybe gets back to the earlier problem of like right. You have, you have to still be able to identify the nose in the other model then, right? Right, but like the, the so that's I mean I think that's why Mark uses these mesh based techniques. Like if you take if you get a mesh, you get a mesh of his face. You compute some sort of feature correspondence. You do as rich as possible mesh deformation. Yeah. You get. Exactly but that. meanwhile, but you've already computed where the nose is on the on the source. You already know where you're telling me you already know where the nose is. I, already, I mean, you can do. It seems to me that the value of the level says it gives you this ability to do this deformation without these feature correspondences, kind of. But as you point out, it starts to fall apart. Yeah. If the deformations are too big. Yeah. If, they're, if, they're, if the models are too drastically different. Yeah. yeah. So it kind of seems like it would be nice if they didn't fall apart. Because if we're moving to the feature correspondence work, you could just do that with meshes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You probably should wrap up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll be happy to, to, to talk more. Yeah. All right. That's, we'll wrap up then. Thanks for coming. <laughs> I'll be happy to talk more. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, it's interesting because, um,